Amen. Well, today we start our new series, This is the Gospel. And we will, over the next several weeks, be going through the Gospel of Mark and looking at the fundamental, essential truth of who Jesus is and, and why he came. And the cool thing also is that your, your kids over in kids' ministry will be doing the same series with us. And our hope is as we go forward is that um, families can have conversations over what they're learning in kids' church and Sunday church, and we can help families grow in their faith together. Amen? Amen. Well, um, as we go through this journey, what, what my hope is, is that we will have a sense of wonder about God's word. You know, the gospel is something, um, the worship team, they, when, they, when they practice, every morning they have a, a moment where they stop and they do this thing called heart to heart. And they take a moment and they share prayer requests, praise reports, and then someone gives a little devotional. And, and part of it today was that sometimes when we've been going to the church for a long time and we've heard the term gospel or the good news, sometimes that can start to feel common to us. And if there's anything that should ever ignite a sense of wonder and exploration in our minds and our hearts, it should be the gospel, the good news. The gospel is not Christianity 101. It is the essential pillar, pinnacle truth of Christianity. It is what it is all about. I want to ask today, and I know we're in El Paso, but how many of you have been to the ocean before? Most of us. Now, I remember the first time I went to the ocean as a little El Paso kid, and I just, from left to right, and as far as I could see, was this body of water. Did any of you remember the first time seeing that? And just that sense of, of awe that could come over you. And, you. and and you realize that today we've only discovered, I think when I when I last checked, it was like six percent or something like that, maybe less, of what's actually in the ocean of our own planet. And I feel like God's word is like that. There, there's the things we can see and that, that, are, that are apparent and obvious to us. And then as we really think about it, as we really explore it, we learn how much more there is to explore and discover. Athanasius was an early church father. I'm talking in first century, old school church. He compared the depth of the gospel and what Christ had achieved to the countless waves of the sea, that each one is beyond our grasp of understanding, and yet they're almost infinite in supply. And that's the feeling that I pray that we get as we explore the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, today, I want you to use your imagination with me this morning. Um, imagine that you and I are first century Christians. These are, these are the, this, the first wave, the OGs, okay, of Christianity. And, and, and Mark's gospel is written first and foremost to this group of first century believers. It's for us today but it was written and distributed to them in a very specific context and, and urgency. Now, Christians at this time, there had been a great fire in Rome. In fact, a lot of Rome was destroyed. And to, to deal with the PR of that, basically, the emperor blamed Christians for this great fire that had broken out and destroyed so much of Rome. And so at this time, under Emperor Nero, Christians are in heavy persecution. They're, they're on the run for their lives. And in fact, a lot of them, to have a meeting like this and learn about Jesus, they're meeting in these places called catacombs. 
I don't know if we have that uh, a photo to, to put up there, but there are these catacombs in Rome, these underground places. And what a catacomb is, is it, it's basically a tunnel where, where bodies are buried. In fact, in, in Europe, there are some catacombs that are built from the bones and skeletons of those who are deceased. So the first century Christians, aren't, aren't you grateful you have a chair today? The first century Christians, they are meeting in locations like this to talk about one who had died but had risen again. You know, the simplicity of, of Mark's gospel comes in this moment. You can imagine in the first century, they don't, you see in this picture, there's like nice like LED floor lighting. Back then, that didn't exist. So often they were meeting by torch or candlelight in these places where the sun could not come in. And they're in a time where they are being rounded up and killed and executed for their belief in Christ. It is this setting, this scenario in which the gospel of Mark comes to bring light into the darkness and deliver a message of hope and of salvation. And those events were so long ago that it's kind of easy to forget that that those of us who are here today, you get to sit here comfortably and listen to this message and be part of this service today, you get to gather freely and stand on the firm foundation laid by these early believers who turned to Mark's gospel as an indispensable source of encouragement and truth in a time of great darkness and suffering. So let's turn to Mark 1. We're going to start in verse 1. And what I love about it is it just gets right to the point. It says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Notice something here. It it doesn't start with a lengthy genealogy. There's no nativity story. Instead, Mark places us straight into the situation, which I believe reflects the urgency in which Mark's gospel was being put out. And to be honest, I think that's where we are today. I think we're in a time of darkness, and I think we're in a time where we need to urgently get out the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a hurting and a broken world, the message of hope, the message of love, the message of reconciliation and salvation and forgiveness, the gospel of Jesus. The simplicity of Mark's beginning points to a deeper theological truth, and it is this, the good news of Jesus Christ is accessible, immediate, and life-changing. That's what it is. Accessible, immediate, and life-changing. Now, this urgent message, this gospel of Mark was distributed around the year 65 AD, which is roughly 35 years after Jesus went to the cross. Now, Mark composed it based on primarily the eye account of the apostle Peter, Now, sometimes people think, wow, 35 years seems like a long time after which to write something down. How can that be trusted? And what I want to say here at the beginning is we have to remember the context of the time. Making any sort of written document that that could be reproduced and sent anywhere was very time-consuming. It's all by hand. And it's extremely expensive. And for that time period, a turnaround of 35 years is actually incredibly quick. In fact, did you know the most widely accepted sources on the life of Alexander the Great? There are earlier ones, but the ones that are used primarily academically are 300 years after Alexander lived. So here in this context... Christians are being persecuted, hunted down, and killed by Rome. 
And so Mark distributes the eyewitness account of Peter as an encouragement to the church of that time. We have to remember, up until this moment, they weren't needing really to write anything because the apostles were going and sharing what they had seen themselves. But here in this time, as the apostles are, are slowly dying and, and leaving and going to be with, with Jesus, it's in this moment where Mike, Mark urgently writes down the account of Peter and distributes it. So he writes again with urgency, verse 1, the beginning of the good news. He's, this is what he's sending out. He's sending out the gospel, which just basically means good news. He's saying, here's the good news. Is that Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God? And immediately says, that is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through your gospel message today. Lord, if we have not encountered it or heard it, reveal it to us in our spirit today. In your name we pray, amen. My message today is called The Prepared Life. And that is the theme that Mark starts his gospel with, the theme of preparation. He immediately confirms John the Baptist as the fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy, the book of Isaiah, as the voice in the wilderness that will prepare the way of the Lord. It says in verse 4, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. How's that for a Sunday fit? And he ate locusts and wild honey. So there John is. He's clothed in camel hair. He's wild in appearance. And he has this sense of, of urgency. And, and even in who God picks to convey this message that Lord is, the Lord is coming, that we have to prepare and be ready, he picks somebody that kind of represents that. Number one, today, the prepared life embraces repentance. If you want to live a life prepared for the coming of the Lord, you've got to embrace repentance. So number one, the prepared life embraces repentance. In John's life and message, we, we are called to examine our, our readiness for the coming of the Lord and to repent of anything that is keeping us from, from truly embracing him. It, it, it means to be really honest with ourselves and see what it is that we need the Lord to come in and cleanse us from. In repentance, the word I think often conjures up images of street pe preachers holding signs and yelling at people. But what it really is it's more than regret for past wrongs. It's an active commitment to turn away from our old lives and our old habits, our old selves, and instead embrace God's promises and who he says we are. The Greek term for repentance, the word is metanoia, which is spelled meta, like M-E-T-A, N-O-I-A, metanoia. And it, what, it, what it really means, translated, is a complete turning or transformation of the heart and of the mind. It calls, it calls for an active turn from sin and an embracing of God's life for us, God's grace for us. And the reality is that all of us in this room, there's not a single one of us, not, not me, not you, not any of us, that don't have barriers that keep God from truly coming in. We, there's not one of us that doesn't have things we, we kind of turn back to. But not one of us has areas where we do not stumble. And so it's those things that, that cause us to not leave room for the, the coming of the Lord in our lives. Those are the things we need to consistently repent and turn away from in our lives. You know, 
the, these areas are standing in the way of Christ. The, the, these areas are the ones where we are not fully submitted, fully surrendered. Areas that maybe we have hidden away. Areas that maybe we are too afraid to face. But the voice in the wilderness urges us to, to look at these things. The voice in the wilderness calls us to bring those things before God and to make space for God to begin his work in our hearts. His, John's life in the wilderness signifies the call to separate from worldly distraction and to focus on the coming of the Lord. You know, the wilderness historically is where the people of God would face trials, but in those trials encounter God directly. It's where prophets often receive divine instruction and revelation. And John's message then echoes through time now, calling us even today to prepare our hearts for the arrival of Christ into our lives and into our communities. And John serves as a voice saying, repent, which is to remove anything from our lives that does not make room for God. If we have something that we can't or we won't allow God to come into, then that is an area of our lives that we need to repent and surrender to him. And it's not a legalistic thing. It, it's not a morality thing. It's so much deeper than that. It's a thing where God wants to give you a beautiful purity. God wants to give you a, a clean heart and a clean spirit and a, and a sound mind. God wants to come in. He wants you to remove those barriers so he can come in and you can know peace. You know, a clean heart is one that truly knows security. A clean heart is one that truly knows joy. A clean heart is one that knows peace. A clean heart is what can truly exist as a dwelling place for the Lord. John baptized with water for the forgiveness of sins, symbolizing cleansing and renewal. Christ, however, baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And he offers a profound inward transformation. It's this kind of heart change that, that, that John calls us to embrace, laying a foundation for a life that is intimately connected with God. And as, we, as we enter into those two things, when today, you know, when we're baptized, we get to be in the legacy of John's baptism, but in the fulfillment of of Christ's baptism. Jesus was baptized but John, but Jesus fulfilled the premise of baptism when the Holy Spirit descended upon him as he rose out of the water. Number two, the prepared life seeks humility. So first, the prepared life embraces repentance, and second, the prepared life seeks humility. Mark 1, 7 to 8, and it says, talking about John, and this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And I love this. John talks about Jesus, and his reaction is, well, I'm not worthy to even untie his sandals. And that still sounds nice today, like it's a nice sentiment today, but, but it was even more of a profound statement back then. Because in the ancient world, removing the sandals of somebody's feet was reserved for the lowest of slaves, the lowest of servants. It was a sign of having the lowest status to be down at somebody's feet, which were incredibly dirty in those days, and to remove the dirtiest thing. And then, and then they would often then have to clean them. And John's saying, I'm not worthy of even doing the lowest thing unto the Lord. In the Gospel of Matthew, do you know how, this is the, that's the humility of John, but do you know how Jesus describes John? In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus would describe John as the greatest man who had ever lived up until that point. 
the greatest born among women, he would say, meaning greater than Noah, greater than Abraham, greater than King David. Yet John's humility would tell him that he was not even worthy of untying the sandal of Jesus. And I'll be honest, I'm going to be so honest with you today. There are so many times in your life following Jesus where you will feel completely unworthy of what it is Jesus has for you to do. You know, one thing I, that I try to do as a pastor is with our ministry staff, just check in with them, see how they're doing. Can I tell you, almost every one of them feels this thing that we call today imposter syndrome. They feel unworthy to be doing what they do. Can I tell you, there's lots of times I stand up here and I feel unworthy to do what I'm going to do. And I'm going to tell you that a lot of times as you go out to share the gospel with people, you are going, the, the, the tactic of the enemy is, is to make you feel unworthy of delivering the message. That's his tactic. That's what he wants. But I want you to see a, a huge, you know, we think humility just means, you know, I'm not going to do anything. That's not what it is. It's a heart posture. John, in his humility, understands that, man, Jesus is so much greater than, like, who am I? And there's this, this thing, you know, on one hand, our humility is exactly the thing that would allow God to enter in. Because it's in humility that we realize that what we're doing and what we have is a gift. That, we, that what we get to do, anytime we get to do anything for Jesus, it's a gift. And it's that that prepares the way for God to really work in our hearts. John technically is unworthy of untying the sandal of Jesus. Just as you and I are technically unworthy of exactly the same. Yet the grace of Jesus would say that, John, you think you're unworthy of untying my sandal? Well, I say you're worthy of baptizing me. It was John's humility that allowed God to use him for something greater than he could have ever imagined. There's a scripture in Ephesians 3.20. To him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we think, hope, or imagine... That is perhaps the great wonder, the great paradox of humility, is that in lowering ourselves, we invite God to lift us to a place of greater purpose and use, to set aside our pride and instead to focus on the abundance of God's grace and strength. Well, when we humble ourselves, we're not placing ourselves in a, in a position of inadequacy, Instead, we are making room for God's sufficient power to shine through our imperfection. So I want to give you three just um, practical steps to developing humility here today. First, I think it starts with confession. Regularly confess both your strengths and your, and your struggles to God. I know when we think of confession, we often think of, of our weaknesses and our failures. But perhaps sometimes what keeps us most away from God is pride. So sometimes we got to look at the gifts and the talents or whatever it is that we have. And we've got to even confess, God, I only know that I can do this because you gave it to me. Because you have allowed me to do it. Acknowledge areas where you rely on yourself. And, and that... I think in your confession, I'm, I'm turning to myself for this. I'm trying to control this. I'm trying to do that. Once you do that, you can start to then surrender those things to him and, and again, shift your reliance back towards him. Confession, service, serve people. You know, our salvation is not by works, but works are the result of a saved heart. If we really know Jesus and what he has done for us, I believe 100% that there's no way that we could know how good Jesus is and what he has saved us from that we would not then want to do the same for others. 
Look for opportunities. They're all around you. Sometimes all it is is just saying hi to somebody, just giving them a, a nod or a wave. It doesn't have to be this big grand gesture. But look, they're, they're, they're all around you, but you got to have your eyes open to them. That This will align your heart with the servant-like humility that characterized John. That heart says, man, I'm unworthy to do this, but thank God I get to. Prayer. I think maybe one of the greatest makes mistakes today, there's two, I think, for the church, particularly in America. I think one is we, we don't know our word. A lot of us, we don't spend time in our word, if we were honest. And then two, a lot of us spend very little time in prayer. Prayer is the thing we do before we eat. But prayer is, our, is, is, not, it, prayer is our dialogue with God. It's our conversation with him. You know, pray, ask God for you to, what we really need is to focus on Jesus. God, help me to keep my, my focus on, on your son and what he has done and who he is. And pray, pray that he would increase in your life and that you would decrease. I think in the story here of John, he's set a pattern for us to follow. A pattern of repentance and humility that allows us to recognize that Jesus is first. He is preeminent in all things. And when we place our lives at his feet, it's not a place of burden, but it is a place of grace-filled calling. Number three, the prepared life lives expectantly. Mark 1, 14 to 15 says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, here's what I want to say. For families, your kids today are learning about all these amazing things Jesus would go on to do from this moment. And I'm not getting into it today. One, because I want to challenge our adults who are in here that do not, have not read this, to read Mark 1 and read Mark 2, okay? And see, see what Jesus does. But if you have kids today, talk to them about what Jesus does. Amen? The time has come for us to urgently prepare the way by proclaiming the good news of Jesus. John wasn't living life just hoping for the coming of the Lord. He lived life fully expectant for the coming of the Lord. And, and his clothing his lifestyle choices, his message, his mission were all built on the urgency of the arrival of Jesus. And the urgent message of John was clear. Repent and prepare for God is near. The urgent message of the gospel of Mark echoed the urgent voice of John in the wilderness. Repent and prepare because Jesus has come and he is near and he is coming again. And that is the urgent message of today. Jesus has come to bring us salvation, and one day, he will return. And until that day, whether that's tomorrow, whether it's 10 years from now, whether it's 1,000 years from now, until that time, you and I are to be like John, a voice in the wilderness that prepares the way for people to allow him in. Amen? That's what he has called us to do. And the beauty of it is, the gospel is, is that you no longer have to hold on to the mistakes of your past. You no longer have to be defined by the, the labels that people have put on you in your life, or maybe that you've put on yourself. But deliverance and cleansing and a renewal has come in, in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And the message to me as we look at this is clear. The time is now. Not tomorrow, not next week, but right now. We can't sit back. You know, one of my favorite musicians is John Mayer. He has a song called Waiting on the World to Change. Have any of you heard that? 
She, okay, you're a mayor fan? Okay, it's just, I guess it's just me and you. <laughs> cool. <laughs> but, but, but the song says, someday my generation will rule the population, so I'm just going to keep waiting on the world to change. And I think there's something so wrong <laughs> with the message of that. And I think there's something so wrong about Christians that are always waiting for somebody else to bring the change of Christ into the world. If you're relying on our government to bring Christ and change things, you're doing it wrong. It doesn't matter what side you vote for, neither of them are Christ. And they're not going to fix the issues that Christ fixed. The issue of sin and destruction. In abuse. All those things are a ramification of sin, and government policy will not change that. But the kingdom of heaven can. So stop waiting. The time is now. We can't wait for others to do it. We can't be the kind that thinks someone else will step up, someone else will speak out. No, the time is now because people right now are hurting. People right now are dying. And, and, and what they're really waiting for, though they don't know it, is the hope that Jesus can bring them. And the only way they'll know it is if you tell them about it. Look at what we have in our society right now. We've got division. We've got hatred. Anxiety is through the roof. There's pain. It, it feels like society is just tearing at the seams, doesn't it? Families are, are being ripped apart. Friendships are, are, are breaking. Fear is gripping the hearts of so many in this time. It's like darkness is closing in. And it's like those Christians in Rome hiding in the catacombs out of fear for their lives. All the while, the world is desperately crying out for answers. And we know we have the answer, don't we? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the time has come for us to emerge from the catacombs and let the world know the good news. Because you and I, we've been given the greatest gift. We have been given the truth. And yet too often we hesitate. But listen again to what Jesus says in Mark 1.15. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This isn't just an invitation. It's a call to action. The time to proclaim the good news is now because the kingdom is here. And there's no time to waste. Church, let me tell you, God is ready to move in this world. God is ready to move on these streets God is ready to move in your schools and your workplaces and your homes. He's ready to move through you, through this body of believers. But, but we can't wait until we feel more comfortable, until the moment just feels right, or until all our fears and doubts have vanished. The time has come to speak life into a, a world filled with death. The time has come to bring hope where there's a world filled with despair. The time has come to shine light where there is darkness taking over. We, you, you can go anywhere today and see chaos, but realize you have not been called to be a peacekeeper, but a peacemaker. And what is it that makes peace? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are people bound in chains of addiction and depression and sin, and yet we have the key to unlock and free them, and we keep it to ourselves. We have Jesus, the one who breaks every chain, the one who brings freedom and healing and salvation, and he has entrusted you. He trusts you. Let that sink in. He trusts you with the message that brings life. Do you think as a parent, one of the most trusting things you can do is allow someone else to care for your child. That's one of the most trusting actions, isn't it? I'm going to turn the, you over to the babysitter, to our child care at Crosspoint Kids, to 
I, I'm going to bring them to grandma's house for the weekend. One of the most trusting things we have to do sometimes as parents is entrust our children with other people. Jesus has done that with you. He's entrusted his, the world. Remember last week, we looked at that idea that, that God desires that all would be saved. God desires that all would be his children. He has entrusted the care of that to you. He has entrusted us with the message that changes everything. But this is not just about duty. This is about expectation. When we proclaim the gospel, we should expect that God will move. We should expect that hearts will change, that lives will be transformed and souls will be saved. Do you believe that? Because when we speak the name of Jesus, something happens. All the evidence to me is there in the world. There's only one religion in our country right now that's constantly blasted. You can be anything you want to be, but you speak Jesus and you offend everybody. Why? Because Jesus is the truth. And there's power in the name of Jesus. And what you see when Jesus' name proclaimed and people react in that way is darkness fleeing. When we share his love, I believe heaven invades earth. Lives don't stay the same. Strongholds break. People come to the foot of the cross and find freedom because that's the power of the gospel. And let me tell you, church, the world is waiting. The world is waiting on on change. They want something different, something new. And they don't realize it, that that thing they're searching for, they won't find out there, that they'll only find through Christ. Your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends, people you see every day are longing for what only Jesus can, can give to them. But how will they know it if we do not tell them? How will they hear it if we do not share it? Romans 10, 14, it asks us the same questions. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Church, the time has come for us to say, here I am, Lord, send me. The the time has come for us to be the light in this dark world, to be the hope in the middle of all the chaos that we're seeing, to be the voice that speaks the truth in the wilderness of confusion. The time has come to proclaim the good news of Jesus to everyone we meet, not out of obligation, but out of expectation that God is ready to change lives and welcome more prodigals home. So I'm challenging you today. Will you step up? Will you speak out? We expect God to to move when you share his love with others. Because as Jesus said, the time has come. The kingdom is here. God is ready to move. If we're going to live life expectantly and prepared for God to move, we have to live like John lived. And uh, we need to live with with an unwavering faith. And I know that sounds like a lofty ideal. But to me, an unwavering faith doesn't mean, doesn't mean you're perfect. doesn't mean you have moments where you wonder. But what it looks like to me is that at the end of the day, I trust no matter what I'm seeing that God is faithful to his word. It's just like those three young men in the Old Testament who stood before the fire. And the king said, bow to the idol and you don't have to go in. And those three young men looked at the king and he said, our God will save us, but even if he does not, we will not bow. Just like John, who stood for the message of Christ, even though it would cost him his life. Just like the Christians in the time of Nero, 
that stood in the face of tremendous pressure and proclaimed the gospel of Christ. You want to get inspired for this task? Go later on, search Christian martyrs in Rome and read the stories of those who gave their lives. And oftentimes, in giving their life, they brought others to Christ who witnessed their death. The prepared life lives expectantly for God to move, for God to show up, and for God to most importantly enter into our hearts and transform us from the inside out to the point that we too become a voice in the wilderness. As we continue to travel through Mark, I want us to challenge ourselves with this question. Is my heart prepared for the Lord? And furthermore, am I helping prepare other people's hearts? Let's, let's really seek how we as a church are preparing the community around us. Are we showing the love and grace of Christ through our interactions? Are we, are we paving the way for others to meet him and know him by our testimony and our witness? Jesus brought us together to continue the work of John, to prepare people for the, the way to encounter Christ. And ultimately, when we live life embracing repentance, seeking humility, and living expectantly, what that does is it puts us in a place of preparation to allow others to see Christ through our lives and in our lives. That's the beauty of the prepared life, is getting to share the one who changed our lives with those that he could change as well. Amen? Let's pray. Dear God, as we go on this journey through your word, let us be open to what you have for us. Help us to prepare the way for your son in our hearts, in our minds, and in our church. May our, may our repentance be real. Let's be honest before you today, God. Help us to develop deep humility before you and allow us to have hope. We thank you for those voices throughout history, the voice of John, the voice of those Christians in Rome who would emerge from those catacombs with this gospel to proclaim. Help us to continue to be a part of that legacy and that mission and calling that you have given the church that stands through the tests of time. Guide us to grow closer to you. Help us to display your love in the way that we encounter others today. And we thank you. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and receive the blessing of the Lord as we go here today? After service, our elders will come up and be available to pray with you if you need anything. You know, before service, there are some people sharing some some prayer requests that have been answered, some healings that have happened. And so if you, if you need something, it, it, it's not us. It's not Crosspoint. It's not our elders. It's not me. It's God. And God loves to work and move among his people. Amen. To receive the blessing of the Lord as we go here today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Remember, you are loved and you matter. If you need prayer, please come and pray with us.